Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Kennan Institute. Okay, I'm Matt Rojansky, the director of Kennan, uh, for those who don't know me. Uh, it, it gives me great pleasure uh, to be able to introduce this afternoon's event. Um, I will then get out of the way. Uh, I will also ensure that we make good use of the, uh, of the earphones and the translation devices, so please make sure that uh, if you don't understand Russian, because the event will be in Russian, that you have one. Um, because in just a moment we'll switch. Uh, but I, I will introduce both of our uh, speakers uh, in English first. Um, Dr. Leonid Gozman, who's visiting us uh, from Moscow, is president of the Union of Right Forces and former chairman of uh, Prava Dela, the Right Cause Party. Um, he has had a great many uh, political and private things, including uh, leading humanitarian projects at Rusnano. Um, uh, he was an executive board member of UES, uh, the Russian uh, energy company, uh, has been uh, a political advisor to uh, Anatoly Chubayas and Yegor Gaidar, um, has authored books and lectured at Moscow State University, uh, and we're very fortunate here in the United States, has done a number of uh, visiting fellowships, including here at the Wilson Center, uh, where he worked on uh, social entrepreneurship uh, for deepening democratic development in Russia. Um, our own Sergei Parhomenko, uh, who is now a senior advisor with the Kennan Institute, having completed a fellowship here as well, um, is a widely known Russian journalist, publisher, civic activist, and much, much more. Um, he uh, founded and was the first editor-in-chief of Itogi, which was Russia's first current affairs weekly published together with Newsweek. Uh, he served as an editor of Vakruk Sviata around the world, Russia's uh, oldest monthly magazine, um, <laughs> and has since August of 2003, is it that long? Wow. Been presenting Sud Sabliti, <laughs> the crux of the matter, on Echa Moskvi, um, which is a weekly, a wonderful weekly program you can get on, on podcast, wherever <laughs> you listen to podcasts. Um, I highly recommend it. Uh, he has founded a number of really phenomenal uh, civic initiatives, and uh, and I, I look forward um, to uh, to the conversation that he will be able to have with Leonid, uh, because um, I think about uh, the phenomenon of civic activism in Russia today is in some ways maybe less of a political phenomenon and more of a moral phenomenon or a philosophical phenomenon, and so. Um, without suggesting that we'll have a philosophical conversation today, I think that we couldn't have two more perfect uh, gentlemen to have this conversation. But I think we'll open with Leonid's presentation, and then Sergei will begin the conversation, and we'll make sure to leave plenty of time for audience questions. So, pasednaya slova, peridam slova Sergeju, Leonidu, spasiba. Spasiba, spasiba большое. Thank you, thank you very much, Matt. We are indeed very happy to welcome here at the Kinan Center a very famous man from Russia. And uh, in addition to what Matt has um, said about his biography, I wanted to add that Leonid Yakovlevich is in a very rare and unique position in Russia. He is one of the last people who dares to regularly, sometimes even several times a week, to appear on the most, uh, the most uh, scary place in Russia, in hell, on the federal TV channels that are controlled by the Kremlin, in order to sometimes have a moment there to say something important about important things which uh, never are spoken about at these channels. And uh, Leonid and I and other people on Facebook have all have asked our, ourselves, you know, many times, how is he able to do this? Does he take any kind of drugs? Or what is his special diet that makes him so special? Is he on some kind of special physical regimen in order to be um, so able to survive uh, such a 
a task. So maybe we'll talk about it today, and maybe seriously, and not in such a joking matter, because it is not a joking matter. It's very interesting, and um, a rare situation, a rare ca capacity of a person to do this. So now I'm going to give him an opportunity to make his um, presentation. I want to make sure that I'm not blocking the view. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. I was here at the Kenan Institute in November 1999. That was my first time here. So many years have passed since then. And um, it was my second trip to the United States. But the first time when I came to the United States, I wasn't just a tourist to see the White House or to see the Washington Memorial. But um, um, I was more plugged into the other interesting life. And ever since then, the United States became a very important country for me. Um, and I'm very glad to be here every time I visit. I think Matt made a small mistake by organizing when organizing this event, because I don't think I can say anything new, something you don't know. Because when I suggested to speak here, I didn't know that Sergei is here. But when I learned that Sergei is here, it was already too late. And I think that he already knows everything better, better than I. And uh, since I am here, I might as well, basically. But, but he's been here for many years, and he um, hosts the best weekly program in Russia, the best. And so he knows a lot more than I do. So I am not sure what I can add to this. I can, of course, talk about my role on television. Uh, and since I'm here, might as well just make the presentation that I was planning to make. When everything started at the end of 80s and in the early 90s, before the 80s, I was not allowed to travel abroad. In the 90s, I began to travel, and I would speak with lectures. Uh, and it was very nice, because whenever I spoke about Russia, I told everybody how wonderful the country is, how it's developing, how we are solving these problems quickly quickly, and how everything is just so great, so wonderful. And um, as Yuli Kim used to sing, besides Sputnik and the flag on the moon, um, I am ashamed of my country. And we were not that proud of the Soviet Union, but Russia uh, in the early 90s was um, uh, was a point of pride for us, and I was really <coughs> glad to spoke before foreign audiences to tell them about this wonderful country where I come from. But today, no longer the case. I still live there. I still love my country. I want the best things for it, but um, and I want to be proud of it, but it's become much more difficult to be proud of it. Many people who come to the United States or to the West talk about the violation of human rights and falsification of elections. I'm not going to talk about that, because I think all of you know this already. You may not know the particulars. Um, so this is a very well-informed audience. Um, you know the situation overall, so I'm not going to talk about that. Rather, I would like to talk about other important things, things that are important for the United States, uh, what I think is important for the US and the West in general. Unfortunately, unfortunately, with great regret, I must say that my country, country where I live, which I love, which I don't plan on leaving, represents today, as I think, a threat to the world and a threat to itself. And I don't think we'll be able to come to some kind of agreement with it. I know that people are trying to come to an agreement, try to understand, you know, what our leadership wants, and let's give them a little bit of uh, leeway, but it's not going to work. It's not going to work 
because the goals that the country's leadership now are very different from the goals that they're actually stating. And it maybe is very sad, but nonetheless, until the Russian authorities and Vladimir Putin uh, change, the situation will worsen, the world will become more dangerous, and the threat of a great war will only grow. This is my opinion. And um, it's not just because our president as a person is um, a villain, but the situation, uh, the situation that the country finds itself with his, of course, active participation in it, created um, a situation f to make it impossible for him to have a normal relationship with the rest of the world anymore. So we must agree that the Russian Federation as um, the government of Russian Federation is a threat, and so we need to neutralize this threat to prevent a great war. We need to understand this country. We need to be able to understand it in order to neutralize it. And so there are many stories uh, circulating around about it. Funny stories, scary stories, disgusting stories. There's many myths about it. And those are myths and not anything connected with reality. For example, one of the myths is that Russia is on the verge of um, collapse. It's not true. It's still functioning and actually functioning rather well. Despite the sanctions, uh, it's um, functioning well. That Putin will give way and concede. Never, never would he concede under pressure. Not because he is just a strong person that never concedes, but because he knows that if he concedes, he will lose legitimacy, he will lose power, and with that power, he will lose his freedom, maybe, lose his head. So another myth is that Putin is not being supported by anyone, that his regime is relying only on force. No, it's not true. He is very much supported. His support is being uh, is decreasing, but it's still very, very large. Um, not everybody, of course, supports him. Sergei Parhominka and I, we don't support him. So, and there are a lot of people like us in Russia. Some people believe that um, after Putin leaves, everything will be fine and well, but we don't know actually what's going to be after he leaves. And any negative evaluations of um, the regime don't necessarily mean that after this regime ceases to exist, things will improve. Some time ago, we had a very archaic monarchy, a very slow, very dumb, you can call it any way you like, but after its collapse, we um, learned what real catastrophe is like. Only after the collapse of the Tsarist regime did we realize what true hell is like. And uh, some people believe that um, if we have free elections, the Democrats would win. You can't, you can't bet on that. That needs to be tested. Um, and there are many examples to that in Russia. Whenever there were free elections, the Democrats would uh, unite and take most seats in Duma or the um, governmental assembly. That may be great. That may be happen. That maybe will happen, but maybe not. Nobody really knows this. Of course, there's another myth that uh, after Putin's uh, departure, there will be a fascist dictatorship. It's possible, but maybe not. Maybe not. We just don't know. So there are many questions that we need to find answers to. And one of Hungarian poet, whose name I can't remember and can't pronounce, some very hard to pronounce name, but he said that we know all the possible answers, but we don't know what the question is. And the questions are the important part. We need to um, formulate those questions correctly. What are the questions? For example, the resiliency of the Russian economy. It was greatly underestimated. So much talk was um, surrounding the Russian economy that is going to collapse, that sanctions will collapse it, and uh, when uh, the oil prices went um, down and collapsed, yes, there were some worsening and of course there are some protests and the ratings go down but the system is still there still as plucky as ever and there is still no real threat to the system what is this uh, resiliency and how long will it last we don't know 
another question is the goals of Russia's foreign policy. Whenever we're trying to talk to our leadership, uh, I believe that many people in the West believe that uh, Russia has traditional for foreign policy goals, for example, security, economy, um, business, entrepreneurship, but I don't think those are important for the foreign policy of Russian Federation. If people from the embassy are here, they may disagree with me, but that is my very firm belief. I believe that there are two goals. First goal is uh, internally political, that the leadership of Russia and Putin personally absolutely must to ha must have foreign enemies, and be that you and just Ukraine and just Estonia is not enough. This enemy must be um, a really good one, a really worthy one, such as America. America is surrounded out with military bases. America wants to occupy us. If we didn't take the Crimea, they would be there tomorrow. They build a lot of myths around it. And this, these myths are absolutely necessary in order to explain to the population why the prices are growing, why the quality of life is dropping, why we have such a sorry state of the health system. And um, having such an enemy and the ability to consolidate the people against this enemy is the entire basis for Putin's legitimacy. He doesn't want to have America as a partner. He wants to have America uh, as a and the West as an enemy. The second goal of his foreign policy is very personal to Putin. I believe that he, Putin's foreign policy is a foreign policy of this king of the early Middle Ages who would um, um, and have a war with another uh, king because he, he didn't feel respected enough. And so that was the cause of uh, a war. So I believe that Vladimir Putin, in his foreign policy, wants to earn respect, acknowledgement of himself as a great leader, as a great um, person, and he needs to have that constantly validated and reaffirmed. It's very personal. Uh, uh, Harl Lasser, one of the American uh, invest in researchers and founders of political psychology, he says that uh, this is a person who sur solves his personal problem with political means. And um, I believe that foreign policy of Putin is very psychological in nature, is very personal for him, and uh, it's very difficult to make any kind of progress with him because love and appreciation, what he wants, is not something that you can just put into an agreement or a contract or a treaty. It's not the language that the treaties are made of. So we need to understand the reasons for his popularity and support. You probably know, and if you don't, it's easy to really find out that his rating has um, dropped significantly. All of the ra other ratings of the various institutions institutions of Russia also have dr dropped. It is, of course, the consequence of the attempts to um, conduct a pension fund reform, but also is due to the fact that uh, for the past five years we have had some difficulties in the country. But still, popularity is high. Why do people still support him? I have uh, listened to my uh, Western friends telling me that these are, this is just the Russian way. You know, you are not a typical Russian, you are a Jew, but typical Russians like dictatorships, they don't really want freedom. I believe that is just racism, frankly, but um, you know, a country uh, that born uh, Andrei Sakharov uh, is not a country that doesn't appreciate freedom. Uh, but we need to understand this country. And uh, observers, especially foreigner, foreign observers, but also domestic observers, all underestimate something about Putin. Putin gave uh, a very high self-esteem, national self-esteem to the Russian people. People started to be, to be more proud to be Russian. Uh, it's been a long time since Russians have felt uh, proud of themselves. Of course, it's a very pathological foundation for pride, for national pride, but this is all we got. And people were proud of um, annexation of the Crimea, and they started to feel better about themselves as a nation. And uh, as citizens of that nation, they started to feel better about themselves. A stronger moral, um, we are protecting Russians on the Donbass, um, they are not allowed to speak their native language, you know, all of that nonsense. 
And I believe that this is the foundation of the support that he enjoys, at least one of the pillars of his support. But I'd like to add that this base of support has been rather drastically decreasing. It's been rotting at the root. Something's going on there. For example, when we, when I say we, I um, believe that we are responsible for our country to some degree. When we annexed Crimea, that was a great celebration. Some may have been ashamed and horrified, but those were the minority. Majority of the people were overjoyed. And I went to the Vasilyevsky Spusk um, and um, saw the celebration. People ce were, were celebrating it. And um, but the three year, when there was a three year um, anniversary of uh, annexation, this um, celebration was not near Kremlin. It was on Vorobyovy Gora. And there were some strange people and uh, also some students who were paid about 300 rubles per to participate. So this joy over Crimea has gone. But the feeling that it was the correct thing to do, it's still there. The feeling that uh, we are surrounded by enemy is, is still there. When we're still a little hungover from the um, our bold actions, yes, it's still there. So Putin's support is dwindling, but is still very, very high. Still, we also need to understand the state of Russian protest. It's difficult to evaluate it um, from outside because um, uh, leaders of various parties may seem like a serious thing, but um, there are many parties that are not very serious. Um, few people um, in it and don't really have any clout. And opposition, that which is understood as opposition here, we just don't have that. We have some structures that use legal procedures are trying to um, come to power. They have a chance maybe to come to power. For example, the Democrats have taken back the House, uh, the, the, um, uh, the um, House of Representatives here in the United States, or, in the, or for example, in Germany, we have the Social Democrats taking over. This is something that you understand. Um, you understand how this works here in your country, how this is normal part of the proceedings. But in Russia, um, a the power, power cannot be transferred through elections. You know, when Navalny was prohibited from participating in elections, um, you know, when, when he was expected to take 5% of the votes, he took 25% of the votes. And so they prohibited him from participating. And if he took 60% of the vote, um, so Banyan would still remain the mayor. And the elections would be canceled, Navalny would have been arrested or killed, anything you can imagine. But this current um, regime will not be changed due to votes, due to elections. And, the, and we don't have a position that can change the regime through elections. The protests are very important. These protests form the civil society that can prepare the situation for the day after, because this uh, regime will come to an end eventually, and we must prepare for that day, for that eventuality. But even the most popular people in Russia cannot win elections, at least, uh, you know, any significant elections. I think that we live in a, in some kind of a, you know, uh, how to call it, at a period of uh, the last period of existence of this system. Uh, we live uh, of the uh, under the organizing this system, and this organizing can go on for forever. It can go for for one year, for two years, for twenty years. I don't know how long, but uh, that won't be any uh, new quality of the system. It will be either like it is, or it will die. And it will, might go on for a while. Back in 1905, when the Tsar uh, ordered, maybe ordered, maybe just allowed it to happen, the uh, the shooting, mass shooting of the peaceful demonstration uh, in, in Petrograd. Uh, Georgi Gapon, the leader of that movement, said uh, a very interesting thing. He said, "We st we don't have a Tsar anymore." 
a czar cannot shoot at the, his own people. Uh, it's not a czar anymore. But although it was, it was an absolute monarchy uh, at that time. So uh, it's been uh, after 12 years uh, later, 12 years later, for another 12 years, monarchy existed. So I don't know for how long it will it will it will exist. But this feeling, this feeling of the end, it's somewhere in the air. Uh, just like then, before 1917, the Tsar was still in power. Everything was stable, looked stable. But people were already discussing what would happen when the Tsar is no more. Uh, everybody would, uh, everybody understood that just a little bit more, and Nicholas II and monarchy will 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 be no more. And now a lot of people are discussing what will happen after. Uh, Putin. Putin just been reelected. His uh, official term is until 2024, but the most popular uh, number in our uh, discussions is uh, 2024. So everybody is discussing what will happen after and before and before. What will he do before? And this feeling uh, is very strong, and there are uh, quite a, f a few manifestations of that, of the end, coming end. Uh, sometimes I mean, a person can feel well, but upon examination, uh, certain terrible diseases will be found, and the doctor understands that, well, he is doomed. And I will try to play the a role of the doctor and what I think about what uh, sim symptoms that are deadly potentially I see. This is a negative rating, negative rating basis. If, uh, if you talk to people who voted for Putin back on the presidential election, actually uh, the person came and uh, voluntarily uh, voted for Putin. If you ask, why did you do that? Why, why did you do that? Uh, why? For what? And that person would, uh, with high probability, will give you one or two explanations. First, uh, there's no mo nobody else, and because the rest are clowns, a bunch of clowns there who are the nobodies. And uh, uh, this is a normal election uh, choice in a democratic country. Because the, a lot of people, uh, because a lot of people voted for Clinton, not because they liked her, but because you know they thought that Trump is even worse. This is a normal thing for a democratic society, normal situation. Uh, we choose a le lesser evil. The second uh, reason that they could provide uh, is uh, they are without Putin. Without Putin, it will be even worse, much worse. Without Putin, there will be economic collapse, economic crisis. Uh, uh, Americans will uh, will invade. The Chinese will invade. Uh, or, or the Polish, or whoever. Uh, something terrible will happen. Uh, Putin is kind of like a protector. He protects us from uh, the external uh, enemies, external shocks. And this is good. This is normal, too. But nobody will ever provide any third reason. Nobody will ever say, I voted for him because he will make the country better. And I voted for him because uh, in 2024, by that time, he will build more roads. We'll have norm normal roads, just like in Germany, just like in America. He will do that. Let's give him another six years. Or he, over these six years, he will uh, make the health system normal so that we, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And you will not hear that. Yeah, there will, there's nothing positive, n not at all, as I think. And uh, again, the uh, social uh, contract uh, is kind of like has been violated. It's been, uh, and it, it was, there was, uh, it was quite serious. What they called uh, sausage in exchange for freedom, uh, like we give you a good life and you don't interfere to government affairs, to politics, and, in politics and so. Yeah, over the 2000s, early 2000s, that's that's how it was. Uh, but uh, the quality of life was getting better uh, m m for different reasons. Uh, maybe Maybe it's just a, a windfall in uh, terms of uh, price, oil prices. Maybe it's market institutions that uh, finally began to work uh, by the 2000s. And that's another reason. Maybe something else. Maybe uh, it was just, you know, uh, wise leadership of Putin. I don't know. But the uh, life was becoming steadily better. And uh, just uh, to appeal to people, like, okay, Putin is, uh, has been here for a while, and he falsifies the, the elections. There's like, oh, you know what? You know, st uh, who cares about falsifications? But like if people uh, live okay. But now this contract has been is no more. After the Crimea, uh, the life is getting much worse uh, and, and quickly. And by and, and the, the process continues, uh, and we don't see the, any end to that. Uh, nobody's even promising that the life will get better. 
And that is this is serious. You understand? And, and another uh, invisible contract. We will we will give you everything, but we can steal. We can buy uh, yachts. We can buy palaces, etc. And our society is kind of like uh, resigned to that. And just another uh, anti-corruption uh, revelation or, or the, another movie by film by Navalny. And any other country that would be just uh, you know people would really uh, be pissed off. But in, in our country. People don't care. Okay, just like because uh, we have a kind of like a vestiges of feudal society, and there is no feeling that everybody should live according to the same laws. And uh, it's like uh, there are diff different laws for different uh, levels for different groups of people, and certain people have certain rights. Okay, they are steel, but they have the right. Uh, they have the palace, uh, and yes, they, they can do it. Uh, and you're you're a czar, you live in a palace, and I'm just a you know peasant, and I live in my hut, and it's normal. But nobody knows where that border line is. And just recently, uh, Putin had uh, uh, 28 res residences, 28, and um, well. Well, it's a huge country, yes, it's difficult for him to move around at 28 residences. Oh, now it's probably more. 28 is like, uh, it, it is uh, under Nemtsov, it was still, Nemtsov in his report uh, said probably much more now. Nobody knows. But what if uh, another, just the 34th uh, residence will become the la last drop, the uh, that last straw? Uh, nobody knows uh, that uh, can, or for example, he uh, it, 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 it cracks down on the on, on demonstration. Uh, people demonstrate against the pension reform, and uh, in Moscow, for example, you know, a th thousand people were arrested just for for in one day, and nothing happened. Uh, the society didn't even react. And okay, uh, if. What if another thousand is arrested? Maybe the society will. What if uh, they, sh they shoot at the crowd, just like uh, the monarch once did? Then what will happen then? Nobody knows. And that uh, invisible, uh, vague uh, contract that in its, in some parts, uh, just not. Uh, at the same time, nobody knows where the last straw will come. The uh, archaics, uh, are, are, are the archaic values. Uh, once we had an in interesting word, Ural Vagon Zavod, back in 11 or 12, there were some protests, and Putin uh, were talking about uh, to workers, and that was uh, broadcast on the uh, on TV, and there was that Ural Vagon Zavod, a huge factory in the Urals, and he was speaking to Putin, uh, and Putin, and he said, "Okay, uh, Mr. Putin, uh, just tell us. Together with uh, uh, with our guys, we will come over, and we will show to these protesters because they're just getting fat there, and then they don't know what the real life here is. And we'll just uh, common people will show them. And I know uh, for sure that uh, those workers don't even don't really like Putin that much. But it's not important. What is important that what is his basis of support? Uh, in this is the most archaic." Part part of the society, uh, uneducated, with prejudices, with uh, certain biases, uh, of course, rural population. In the Urals, uh, that uh, enterprise, Ural Vagon Zavod, it's a very interesting case. Uh, it's like uh, still uh, the uh, was built under Stalin, it's under in industrialization. And it's completely outdated, uh, and not only they built the bad tanks, not just tanks, but bad tanks mostly, uh, those, it's just menta a mentally outdated uh, enterprise. Of course, huge uh, factories are in the United States as well, but the face of American economy is not them. It's just some other uh, uh, industries. But this archaic industry, some archaic enterprise, has been uh, showcases and, sh and say, Saying, okay, this is what we need. Well, this is what we have, and okay, that. Uh, and overall, you see, of course, uh, that uh, the semi-educated people should not be your base forever. And uh, yes, he is ready to uh, resort to force. The national guard uh, has been created not long ago. Was created not long ago, and that use of force can lead to, uh, can have un unintended and unpredictable consequences. This system is interested in crisis. The system cannot live without the crisis. It needs a constant crisis, a series of crises. 
And of course, uh, that could lead to a war, uh, because why our planes, warplanes, are uh, are flying over the NATO warships, and uh, you know, this one day a NATO officer will uh, will have it no more, and he will press the button. And of course, I mean, they have special instructions to have uh, to have as tolerant as they, they can. And uh, but at some point, a major or a colonel will shoot. And finally, the moral crisis, the moral collapse, you know, it could be the most terrible thing that happened over uh, the Putin's power, uh, especially over the last years, uh, was the uh, 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 collapse of morale, uh, of, 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 of moral values. Uh, people uh, are not angels, uh, not at all. But for a long time, a certain we it was it was not decent. It was not okay to speak up, to say to speak about some things. You could not say you're racist. Racist. You could, uh, for example, think whatever you want about blacks, about the Chinese. But to say that publicly, uh, you couldn't. Uh, well, you might uh, not like homosexuals, but to say that. From the you know on the central TV on a broken a live broadcast to say that I'm a homophobic that was unthinkable. Of course, that's not the only great country where it happens. I know, but I'm talking about Russia now. Uh, and this moral crisis, this moral collapse, is also manifested in the fact that um, they. Uh, people don't believe anything. For example, a Minister of Finance says that, okay, everything is okay, the stability is a stable system, and the dollar uh, will be in circulation, and uh, the, oh, of course the next thing people do, they will withdraw the money from bank accounts just because the finance minister said everything is okay, which means he lied. Uh, they, they are not believed in, in anything, in anything. And that is also serious, a uh, very serious uh, factor. How, what can be in the end? How there are uh, the, the scenarios for the uh, for the end? There are biological factors, of course. Nobody is eternal. Nobody is, and the person uh, personality based system. Uh, uh, for that, for such a system, uh, uh, the leader, if the leader becomes uh, sick or whatever happens, I hope uh, my colleagues from the embassy will not uh, say that I uh, called for Putin's death. No, but we all uh, under God, and uh, who knows what can happen. So if anything happens, uh, that would be a, a huge shock for the system, for any country, by the way, if the leader, uh, something happens to the leader, especially sudden. Uh, death of the leader, but if democratic countries have a number of mechanisms to deal with, to cope with that, we don't have such mechanisms. Well, formally, the uh, the president, should, the uh, current prime minister, will become a president because he's next in line. But this is uh, this will be still a circus. He can can he might not be a president. He cannot be a president because in Russia the president is the actually the mediator in different kinds of conflicts. They should be uh, just to find. A common ground with everything, with the oligarchs, with the uh, uh, governors, with bandits, etc. So uh, Dmitry Medvedev, of course, is not capable of something like that. Could be a war of, elite, of elites. Is it possible? Yeah, of course. Uh, although, uh, you remember that joke that uh, Putin uh, came, uh, comes to the restaurant and uh, together with his uh, uh, entourage and is uh, what do you want uh, fish or, uh, uh, or, or or meat and uh, about about what about vegetables and uh, vegetables will also become meat so we just you know have this ne negative selection and so I don't think that they are capable of any serious actions other than intrigues. Next is integration of the country. Of course, it's possible. And we see very serious examples of conflicts between Chechnya and Ingushetia, which haven't been solved to this day. And separatist tendencies, of course, have increased, are increasing. And um, you see, when it is... Uh, Workday in Moscow, Vladivostok goes to bed. It is a very big difference. It's difficult to manage such a big country. To fly from Vladivostok to Tokyo to Seoul is uh, faster and cheaper than it is to fly to Moscow. And the economy, of course, reflects that. They um, drive Japanese cars with the uh, steering wheel on the right and um, so on and so forth. So it's quite possible for the country to disintegrate if it, um, and it's possible that it's not going to 
go peacefully. Another possibility is that there will be another unsuccessful, uh, uh, unsuccessful game by uh, the government or some kind of um, local revolt or a great war will come. You know, uh, some kind of apocalyptic scenario is also possible. I think the most possible is local revolts uh, that would put the end to the system. I believe that um, just imagine, in a small town, people were not paid their wages, the local oligarch didn't pay their wages, and the people have taken to the streets, not against Putin necessarily, they go, they take to the streets to appeal to Putin, come, father, protect us. This happened before, several times, and the father would come and protect them. But if at the same time in another town, the roads are broken and um, the ambulance didn't make it in time to save a boy and the people also take to the streets. And since um, the government uh, management system is uh, falling apart, we can see disintegrating really um, visibly in front of our eyes. If several such events happen simultaneously, what would uh, be the reaction? What would happen? There will be not enough resources, not enough money to pacify everybody. They would have to send, uh, you know, special police. You know, how do you know that the special police would would um, uh, would uh, do what they're supposed to do? When during the uh, was the attempt to switch the cars to. Um, uh, to have the steering wheel on the left like it is everywhere else in Russia. And uh, when the Far East resisted that, they would send, the authorities would send special police from Moscow down there to sort it out because they didn't really trust the local police, you know, uh, to do this properly. Uh, of course, that was during the Stalin's um, time, and uh, he had multinational empire. And um, when I was studying at the university, um, we had on the Neva uh, another building, right next to our building, where the gates were always closed. One time they were open, and I saw that there were some soldiers there um, wearing the uniforms of of, um, um, of uh, special police. And um, uh, in the provinces, of course, Russian people are not very necessarily educated or progressive. And when people ask us, where are you from, when we, say fr when we said from Leningrad, these people wouldn't even know where it was necessarily. Um, because when we say St. Petersburg, they wouldn't even know. Uh, they know that uh, Leningrad is a big uh, city with, um, with uh, you know, big buildings and a big river, and people would uh, know what I'm talking about. In Samarkand, I would meet. I met once a a guy from Leningrad who explained to me how he hated Uzbeks. He told me, you don't know, Uzbeks are the worst people in the world. I hate them. Just give me an order to destroy them. So that was back in the day. So now we don't know if the local police would um, comply with the orders from the center. So that's basically all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Leonid. And the more time we have for questions and answers, the better. I think there will be a lot of questions, but I will um, use my prerogative here to ask the first one. I would um, use the more formal address when addressing you, even though we know each other for many, many years. In your presentation and in your world view, only once. Uh, at this last, on this last slide, we, when we talked about the war of the elites, other people were mentioned. The rest of the presentation talked about two types of people, Putin and the people. And there is, they have some kind of relations between them, and uh, one is uh, ruling over the other, while well, as the other is... Um, concerned about the first, but there's just the two of them. And I understand that we're talking about in generalities here, um, 
having a philosophical look at these problems, but it is a very simple picture of the world in Russia. But in Russia, there are others, you know, communities of government officials, of um, military people, of um, former KGB and FSB, and some young people who have completely different worldview, who have maybe studied somewhere and are plugged into the internet. There are other very closely linked communities with their views their desires, their plans, and their destinies. So where, uh, where should we look to? Who do, should we talk about? Who can be a real player in this um, mosaic, in this fight between Putin's team and the people's team? Thank you. You are very correct that this is a great simplification it's intentional on my part because um, you know we don't have a lot of time to delve into the nitty-gritty and so i was hoping to save this for the question and answer session why did i decide to simplify intentionally this because i believe that all of those groups that you have uh, mentioned the military fsb um criminals, young people, and so on and so forth, uh, officials, uh, government employees. Yes, yes, there are many different um, groups. And uh, we have a very difficult, very different, uh, complicated uh, structure of society in Russia, much more complicated maybe than here in the United States. But they are incapable of changing the regime. I don't think they can change it. I think the regime would change through some kind of collapse. I didn't put down revolution on this slide. It was an oversight of mine. Because I would like to add that um, it, it's possible. Lenin said that, you know, for the revolution, the, uh, the um, the government should be incapable to sustain the balance, whereas the people must be unwilling to sustain it. But I believe it's not necessarily um, because of that. What's important for revolution is not so much that a lot of people are mobilized, but um, a lack of people willing to protect the regime. The Tsar was not protected by nobody. Kerensky was not protected. Yeltsin, of course, had 100,000 people surrounding him in the White House. And that's why the coup co didn't succeed, because they couldn't get to Yeltsin without uh, killing several, maybe tens uh, of people. And so, for whatever reasons, the army didn't want to do that. And so, I believe one of the key achievements, quote unquote, of the system is that nobody would um, protect it. Nobody would voluntarily be willing to die to protect the system. And so we don't need a lot of people to mobilize t for the system to collapse. National Guard, I don't know if they would defend uh, the regime. Uh, it's You can never know it. The latest Shah of Iran was um, placing his faith in his National Guard. He paid them well, he fed them well, but uh, they um, they supported the people. And uh, I'm talking about Ayatollah Khamenei. And so I know uh, in my experience and based on the experience of other people, whenever I was detained by um, the police at the various rallies, um, you cannot, I would tell them, uh, guys, you are big, healthy, burly guys. You know, there could be rapes going on, uh, robberies going on, and you are protecting Putin from me. Aren't you ashamed of yourselves? And they immediately start to curse, to curse uh, against Putin. And they say, take you Putin and shove him and then fill in the blanks with lots of cursing. Of course, um, they, they're... Of course, if Putin tells them to kill me, they would, but they would not protect Putin with enthusiasm, let's say it this way. So, let's see, the military. Uh, for example, the army 
probably is incapable of some kind of a coup. Um, many reasons for that. I don't think FSB is capable of orchestrating a coup. The oligarchs would never unify and try to overthrow the regime. Um, so I believe that that is not the way to change the regime. But those groups you mentioned, those groups are very important because the day after, what's going to be on the day after, you know, we're talking about the situation when the monarchy collapsed and the catastrophe after. We already lived through that. What is going to happen after this regime comes to an end? And this is the time where we need to have an educated youth. We need to have the FSB. Um, officers and the military officers well informed about the true nature of the regime. And one of the tasks, our tasks, is when I say ours, it's just, I just, I guess, mean just us, is um, so that by this, by the time that day arrives, there are still people in Russia, still people who are prepared to take responsibility on themselves. And um, since we didn't talk about this earlier, but I'm sure that Sergei and I have the similar views on the overall human values, people who will protect those values will still be there, you know, so that they don't haven't become drunks or my, immigrated or um, have, um, you know, internally immigrated, uh, for example. So it's very important for them to still be there. And so whatever the political activists and civil activists are doing is very important. Whenever we have elections, it's uh, quite clear that um, I the regime is not going to be changed via elections. It's just a clown show. But structures are being created. Volunteers, um, the people that participate in these elections, they become citizens in a true sense of the world. And if uh, there is no demand now for uh, citizenship, uh, there might be demand for that later. And um, these people can play a very important role at the time when the time comes. And I know, Sergei, uh, you are spe sp hearing two projects. Um, the last address, you know that one. We have this in uh, countries of Europe. He's launched that pro project uh, several years ago. And it's interesting what's going on in several cities. People know what's going on, that it's not the authorities that are doing this, but the authorities are not daring to openly oppose this. Um, and we see the birth of new people, people of with dignity. And you know, we're so much is being done using fear and um, humiliation. But whenever we see people with self-respect, with dignity, who are not afraid of the system, who um, are able to live a decent life in Russia without becoming slaves to the system, it's very important. Thank you very much. Let's start with questions. And uh, please uh, wait until uh, they give you your thought. Uh, Mike, and please introduce. So the sanctions, do, now we have uh, sanctions. Do they uh, make the Putin's regime stronger or weaker? You know, thank you very much for this question. Uh, Noam Karjavin, our great uh, now demised uh, poet, he just once said, maybe we shouldn't have taken the uh, Winter Palace. But we, there's nobody to give it back to, that's for sure. I don't know if all the sanctions were correct or right. I don't know if the uh, sectoral sanctions were right uh, that, of course, affect the uh, way of life and, and the living standards of many people. I don't know. But now, I, if the United States just go uh, uh, cancel or, or go back, that will be a catastrophe. And we c you cannot do that. Uh, it cannot be done. It should not be done, because that will give the, a very wrong signal to the most re reactionary forces, the most reactionary part of the Putin's brain, that will give them carte blanche for everything. 
or uh, just whatever is done, you cannot undo. But the personal sanctions, I think, is quite a positive thing. I totally, I totally agree with them. And uh, by the way, uh, and it's it's very hurtful for them. You remember when they were just. Uh, the first, uh, remember that the Magnitsky law, Magnitsky Act was uh, adopted instead of Jackson Vanik uh, Amendment. And uh, finally, they listened to the Russians, to the people from Russia, uh, Russia and said, well, uh, Jackson Vanik uh, is not uh, relevant anymore, of course. But we have this short list of uh, uh, several dozen of henchmen, of criminals. Remember how, uh, what the reaction was? And they uh, adopted, what, uh, adopted what they called uh, the law, Dima Yak of lift law, they called it the uh, law of scoundrels, and just they what they decided they uh, they they introduced a ban on adoption of people by the Americans, and a lot of sick children that were about to uh, adopt it died. So you know it, it, it's not it's not just Stalin narcoms. It's just different kind of people, totally different kind of people. You have to understand these people. Uh, for example, a wife is in Switzerland, a mistress in, 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 in Spain, a dog somewhere else, children in Cambridge, and uh, these people, uh, now they have this, this business jet, and that business jet uh, he can use only to fly to Astana, because nobody else will uh, accept, accept them. And this is a difficult situation, but it doesn't mean that they... And I don't uh, rule out, because uh, I don't know, I, I, I haven't spoken to uh, all of those who uh, made those decisions. Maybe it's a, it's a situation of 1801. Uh, it, won't, it won't happen. It won't happen, at least uh, by... But the atmosphere is totally different. Now, the sanctions are quite... Uh, they really work. They work, uh, indeed. First of all, they uh, they make the situation in the Russian economy much worse, uh, and even much worse than the official numbers. The situation now is, if uh, if this much of economy is under sanctions, then this much uh, of economy not under sanctions. But just in case they don't deal with that part of the economy, I know the specific examples when American companies uh, would uh, eliminate contracts with our. Con uh, companies that were not under sanctions. And they would say, well, it's better, just in case, uh, we can do without you. So, of course, sanctions, they uh, put a break on technological process. That means they uh, aggravate the problem of the uh, economic, uh, economic be being economically underdeveloped. And a lot of people, uh, talented people, cannot realize themselves, cannot apply their skills, and they immigrate, they go to uh, different countries. Uh, and uh, finally, the sanctions already were uh, and I, I'm sure that if it wasn't for the sanctions, then back in 19, back in 14, the Russian Federation wouldn't would take not just uh, Lugansk and Donetsk, uh, the two cities nobody needs, but at least they would capture uh, eight uh, uh, region, regions in Ukraine and would uh, install uh, some kind of like uh, their own regime in Ukraine because they had uh, very ambition, ambitious plans. Because there is one thing our leadership cannot afford, only one thing, they cannot afford the uh, mass, uh, de uh, the, uh, when, when a lot, if a lot of people die, a lot of people die, we call it, um, they cannot afford that. They cannot afford a human toll uh, because they will lose the support of the population because the population supports this Ukraine uh, affair just because everybody thinks that this war is cheap. Is, 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 we don't pay for anything. We don't pay for it. So that's why they're trying to conceal the fact, any, ta any facts about, uh, about casualties uh, of our uh, troops. That's why I think, yes, the sanctions uh, do work. Mm, they might be optimal, but we cannot, they cannot uh, go back on that. They cannot leave the sanctions. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned the vestiges of feudal society. Now, Russia for many centuries was a feudal country with uh, the Tsar owning everything and the country divided into estates with landlords who controlled everything. And then uh, the Soviet Union came in, and Stalin became the new Tsar. He 
installed feudalism with the la the estates were called communes and the landlords were called commissars, but it was basically the same thing. And this feudal society continued. Now it looks like Putin is trying to reinstall himself as Tsar uh, with the oligarchs as the landlords. And the question is, uh, 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 democracy is not a collection of elections, it's a culture. And how do you change the culture in Russia to support democracy instead of feudalism? Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, I will reply in Russian. Uh, yes. I don't think, frankly speaking, that Putin uh, would be sitting in his office and, you know, uh, with sleepless, sleepless nights thinking about how to recreate feudalism in, in Russia. Actually, I would like to say a word for him, uh, maybe it's just to me, it, it, it could be quite unexpected. Uh, I think that Putin, uh, actually, he would like to do some good. He would like Russia to be uh, to be fine, to be okay. But his idea about good uh, is totally different from that uh, notion of that I have. I think that uh, he and him and his entourage they think that the existence of uh, such a group uh, that uh, lives above and beyond the law as uh, de Custin, de Custin, uh, Mar 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 de Custin uh, said once about Nicholas the first that justice stops at the steps of the throne it doesn't go any further there is no more law any uh, any higher there is only uh, the monarch's will that's how he views the situation I think and this is quite uh, rational uh, thing what uh, and okay who will work if you don't won't let them steal but it should be if you are a mayor of uh, of a hundred uh, of, of a certain city of a hundred thousand people you can steal that much but if you stole more then you're a bad guy and you will be jailed so this is a this is a culture this is kind of culture yes and it's an important question you know let me just uh, recall my uh, actually I'm a psychologist by trade even a psycho uh, psychologist and I had my own practice in the end of the uh, of the Soviet uh, years uh, uh, just like uh, you can be a former ex psychologist because psycho psycho psychology is actually it's a point of view it's a world view it's not just a number of books that you published and etc etc but uh, the uh, actually therapy uh, is, is, is like this. For example, uh, somebody comes to you and that person is in a difficult situation, is an impasse, some kind of impasse, and uh, it's the end of his own life, or the, of the biography, the, bi the family where he was born, uh, the all other circumstances, and together with this patient, we analyzed that patient's life in order for him to live behind his past and to change his life and he is the only one who can do that you cannot do it for him and just tell him okay from now on you live like this you have to arrive to that decision by yourself but sometimes we succeed and more often we don't but sometimes we do and uh, sometimes uh, the whole countries uh, manage to uh, get out of the crisis. Okay, uh, in the Soviet Union, it's, it's been always thought that Georgian uh, uh, policemen are the most corrupt, or among the most corrupt. Uh, Saakashvili. It's been a while since he's gone, and you know the government's changed. Uh, Georgian policemen do not cannot be bribed. Uh, Japan uh, used to be a backward uh, agricultural country, just uh, rice, fish, and summer rice. Now we overpay for the made in Japan brand. It's got that premium uh, just because the, uh, the merchandise is made in Japan by, Jap by the Japanese and not some migrants in Holland. For example, we bought a car a couple of months ago in uh, 
Let's, let's uh, buy a car that was assembled in Japan. Not in Holland, but in Japan. Maybe we were wrong. Maybe we, we overpaid a couple of thousand dollars, but that's something we believed. We overpay for the brand. But for, brand, for the brand made in Russia, they don't overpay. But for the made in Japan brand, they do overpay. And uh, before, there was no such brand. They made it. They created it. You know, person, a person is free. Uh, the psychology is uh, a science about freedom, I think. Because what we 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 we're speaking about psychology. So why is it possible in the first place? Because there are certain psychological laws uh, that are not based on economic, uh, biological laws. This is freedom. This is a freedom of choice. And you know, even in the extreme situations, the a person is free. They are very. Uh, Viktor Frankl, uh, the Austrian psychotherapy, uh, uh, is uh, he was actually a prisoner of Aswensum, and he came up with a theory, great theory, and he said. I knew uh, about paranoics who killed their en enemies, but I, I knew paranoics who forgave their enem enem enemies. Paranoics, uh, they uh, always see enemies among, uh, around themselves, and uh, these paranoics uh, made choices whether to kill an enemy or to forgive them. Uh, I'm just, I like this subject, I'm sorry that I kind of like uh, deviated, but in, case, uh, in fact, I think that we don't have the pr this predetermination, and back in 1990s or right after uh, the anti-communist revolution of the late 80s, we, we, uh, we had that new system, but with all the imperfections of that system, with all the, uh, with all the uh, terrible things, uh, of course, we've had, it, we've had them all, this system as a democratic system uh, was conceived. Then back then we had a focus group, uh, our, our, and it's just like a, such a grouping test in psychology. We have to subdivide uh, into groups, uh, large or small, alive or not alive or something. And there were cards with uh, different different words. Uh, had to be uh, sorted like blé. Okay, it's Russian. Whiskey, it's something foreign. So uh, it's choice, uh, simple choices. Uh, 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 collections, yes, it's something uh, Russian. Back in 1990s, people, by classifying this into Russian and non-Russian, uh, they classified elections just as Russian. But our culture has everything just like any other. But it's not; bo it doesn't boil down to those feudals, to Stalin, Ivan the Terrible. We have different people. We have Speransky, we have Sakharov. We have a lot of different people. We had a period be between fe February and October. There was a total mess. But there was freedom. There was a freedom. And I I think, and of course, the history uh, set up a very uh, uh, harsh experiment back in 20s, in 1920s, when the white armies, white guards, uh, he, they were le leaving Russia. The most of the soldiers were just there by chance, and they were leaving together with uh, Wrangel in the Far East. And in the in the world, there are no poor Russian ghettos, if you don't consider Brighton Beach, which is not quite a uh, get ghetto. But there are no Russian ghettos all over the world. Uh, those people who actually ended up in a terrible situation uh, with no uh, education, with no, and they managed to adapt. They managed to adapt to the uh, life in a freedom so in, in a free society. So I don't think there is pre any predetermination. <clears throat> Matt would like to ask a question. Thank you very much, Leonid. It's a very interesting and uniquely interesting presentation. And I think that Sergei was right when he said that your voice is unique. And in this regard, I have a question. I would like to mention the first uh, a remark by Sergei when he said that uh, you, unlike uh, most, uh, participate in uh, you know federal TV channel channels in their debates, in their shows, and uh, of course uh, it's, it's part of informational information war uh, that is going on over the Russian TV, and I invite you. Uh, to uh, for some, some uh, self-analysis, a psychologist. Why? What kind of mechanisms uh, you explain that by? Uh, why is it worth, uh, seriously, in uh, considering the uh, situation you're in? That would be re really interesting for me. And just a little bit about uh, 
in, in, a, in a wider context, uh, how does it work? Uh, the civil society uh, and everything, how the protest actions, uh, how do they work uh, in under current situation, cur in the current situation of uh, the uh, common people in Russia? What are the mechanisms uh, uh, can affect or not affect uh, the situation and why is it worth? Uh, thank you, Matt, but these are two different questions, totally different questions. Uh, I uh, will start with the second one uh, that uh, doesn't concern me directly. I think that all kinds of uh, civic actions, of course, I do participate in them, and uh, not always. I, I, I try to I try to participate at least at some uh, non-sanctioned uh, uh, actions because the sanctions one uh, or official ones. Uh, I mean, I don't need it to go there, but uh, but. I don't organize them necessarily. Uh, uh, so I think that it, they affect the situation in a major way because they demonstrate, they show that people are not afraid anymore. They show that there is no consolidated support uh, of the of the uh, leadership of the government. Everything is much more complicated. The person can just, you know, uh, the TV tries to hush that and it always looks like a circus. Uh, a uh, whole uh, square is full of people, 20,000 people, but now an official data is like 300 people. It's just a it's just regular story, it always happens. But people who actually find out the truth about these actions, they might actually, you know, even laugh at those who attended, who came there, and they might think that nobody needs that. Uh, why? But they understand that the society is more complicated than what they're told. Uh, this is a more complicated picture of the world. And in a way, it's education. The uh, world is complex. And when you think that everybody is for Putin, no, no, nobody's, uh, no, not everybody. Maybe you are not for Putin because. Because not, not everybody is for Putin, not everybody supports for Putin. Maybe you don't belong there either. I think it's very important, just like it is important, uh, the political struggle, uh, the elections, the political process, when people uh, conduct, uh, set up campaigns, uh, political campaigns. I think it's extremely important now about myself uh, a little bit. Uh, first of all, it was by chance. By, completely by chance. For the first time, I was invited back in 2008. Before that, I was in a stop list, uh, on their stop list. I know that for sure, because once I met, I met uh, one of the um, our m most uh, prominent scoundrels, uh, pro uh, and I just met him, met him by chance. And they were discussing something about the SPS, and that was just uh, from somebody from the audience. I'm just saying, couldn't you invite me? Why, why, why would you invite this fool? Why invited this fool who does know anything? Uh, who does know anything about SPS? He said, I would, I would invite you, but they wouldn't even show you on TV. You're on the blacklist. Back in 2008, uh, for a number of reasons, I wouldn't dwell upon. Uh, it just happened that I was eliminated. My name was eliminated from that list, and they decided to show me on TV. I suspect they should. They still show me on TV because. <laughs> they just uh, forgot to uh, actually uh, to make amends to this bureaucratic system. After I was the uh, advice to Chubais as a head of administration, they just forgot to uh, take away my pass to that uh, my ID, my uh, official ID, and they forgot to cross me out of that list. And for a couple of years, I kept coming there. I had nothing to do with that system, but the bureaucratic system is just, you know, it works in strange ways. I don't know why they invite me, but they do. And now, why I come there? First of all, I know, and a lot of people told me, some uh, some good people, some uh, honest people, they would say, you, uh, actually, you bring, you're harmful there because First of all, they show you, and you, you're a Jew, and, and you have your whatever you have physical. Some I am actually cross-eyed. You probably don't see it, but I do. Uh, in uh, in other in all the cultures, there's certain bias against people with physical. Uh, physical disabilities, such as uh, uh, cross-eyed or something like that. You know, in Russia they have certain some uh, 
you are cross-eyed, you're a Jew, and you used to be an advisor to Gaidar, Chubais, etc., etc. You are uh, such a great object, such a great, you know, a symbol of all these liberals, uh, disgusting liberals. Besides, you legitimize all their all their Sabbath, as we call it, you know. If it wasn't for you, of course, there were other personalities, characters over there that they, they call the liberals uh, on call. Call liberals, you know. These are people who are, who use, uh, they're invited as liberals, but they're so, they're cowards, actually. They, they just, you know, so scared and so cowardly. And they're very, you know, useful. If there were only such people over there, then uh, these programs would be less legitimate. I think people who say that, uh, uh, they're right, at least in part. They wouldn't, they wouldn't invite me if they, it was, they didn't have any interest. Why I attend? First of all, I think that uh, it could be such a, um, it could be foolish uh, belief, but I believe in, in, in common sense. I believe in that even uh, a certain portion of truth uh, a minor one, it could actually be quite useful. Uh, sometimes I succeed, I manage uh, to, uh, to say the truth and to make people understand the truth. Just recently we were discussing Ukraine, of course that's always discussed because we don't have any other problems, and there was another discussion about uh, some fool that uh, uh, came up with a, election, a lecture about the SS division, Ukrainian SS division, and said, well, you, you wouldn't uh, defend the SS division. No, of course I wouldn't, because it's no less disgusting that, uh, uh, that the uh, NKVD uh, division. And, uh, and of course, uh, they have nothing to say in these situations, because they kind of like, how can you compare our uh, analogs of such SS divisions? And sometimes I give, I provide uh, specific information that I think could be important for some people, but this is not the most important thing. Uh, frankly speaking, I do not address the people overall, all the people, I address the people, the minority, who I think are the peak of the crop, the best of the people, yeah, the Russians, and these people who do not have a great life. And mo uh, some of them are young, active, they don't watch TV, they uh, find the information in, in, in the internet. And, uh, but uh, among them, among these people uh, who think uh, about the same as we do, uh, a, lot, a lot of people, because of their age, of lack of some habit, they uh, do not internet as a main source of information. They just don't. They basically consult the internet to, uh, you know, to pay utilities, Etc. But they get most of the information from the TV. The TV is on. They they're used to that life. They 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 still live like that. And uh, th these people, and from the TV, they tell us, "You are alone now." Especially if that person uh, lives not in Moscow, but some some in some smaller town. Uh, and they tell him, you are the only one left, such a fool, and uh, you have to be grateful that you can still breathe. So walk like everybody, live like everybody, don't stick out, because, you know, uh, everybody is the same. And when this person can see, uh, sorry, me, uh, and can see that I'm not afraid, and I really, I'm not afraid, and that I speak, I say whatever I want, uh, because I can address the president over the first TV channel to say, uh, Mr. President, you're killing the country. Leave, leave, uh, while you have still have a chance to save the country. And they they can see that not everybody is scared. Not everybody is afraid. They can see that uh, they are not everybody became drunk uh, or left the country. It's important. They don't feel lonely anymore, as lonely as before. And I think that another thing is, uh, as a testament that I that I didn't just uh, invented this. I uh, I have uh, something to prove. Every day, every day, literally every day, uh, in somewhere in the street, I am approached by one, two, uh, several persons over a day, and I don't use my car anymore because of traffic jams. So it's like uh, you know, public transportation mostly, normal thing uh, in Moscow. <coughs> and every day, uh, I'm approached by somebody. Uh, they shook my, shake my hand. They, they thank uh, me and they tell me, "Don't give up." And by the way, over these years. It's been no, uh, it's not a single negative contact. Nobody told me, you son of a bitch, you're for the uh, State of Department money, you're doing this. 
I haven't had a single case like that. Maybe there will be, I don't know. Maybe uh, when I come back to Russia, maybe they will beat me up, I don't know. But so far, I haven't had anything like that. Of course, there is one uh, selfish moment that maybe won't, uh, but I have to tell the truth. You know, when I see 10 people in front of me who all hate me, all of them, all of them are ready to kill me, eat me without salt. They can't do anything to me. It is a, such a great pleasure, you know. Okay. We have very little time left. Let's uh, take three more questions. I see some more hands in the back of the room. One question over there. Yes, you will um, take all three questions and then Leonid will um, answer them. Leonid, I have this question. Um, what is your opinion on the following? You said, what will happen after Putin? I personally have this uh, very strong premonition that another Putin will take over. Um, because there are, it seems, no others that uh, arise in Russian politics. Yes, we had Yeltsin, but then Putin came. And Russia is a giant machine, and historical processes take a long time to uh, go. And uh, your examples with uh, Georgia and Ukraine are smaller locations where things happen faster. And uh, we cannot just jump into democracy with one quick leap in Russia. What do you think about that? And yes. Your question, please. Uh, thank, you thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm interested in pipelines, but my question is different. Um, uh, in recent elections, uh, United Russia lost a lot of votes, and in um, some um, regions, United Russia lost uh, the um, governor. Um, do you see a return of the Communist Party in Russia and um, what role would the Communist Party play in your final scenarios? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. My name is Argum. I am an exchange student. Uh, I'm from Saratov. And my question is the following. You mentioned, and I agree with you, that uh, we can't know how much more time remains, two years, five years, 20 years. But my question is more personal in nature. You saw the 90s. You saw the anti-communist revolution, so to speak. You tasted that freedom. What can people of my generation do? You know, our 19-year-olds, our 20-year-olds, uh, our 30-year-olds, what do we wait for? We wait for to, do, should we immigrate? Some people don't want to risk their lives. It's scary to go out there and protest. And what should we do? Should we leave the country or do what? Thank you. Good question. Yes, as the last questions go, as last questions go, this is pretty good. Yes. All right. I'll answer the second question first because the first and the third one are connected. What happened at the government, uh, at the, guber, uh, the governor's elections? Of course, wasn't a success of the R Communist Party of the Russian Federation, but as no such party exists. Forget about it. Zuganov is not a communist. What are you talking about? This was a protest. People would have voted for anyone, for, uh, you know, a dog uh, from the street if it was a candidate from Unified Russia. Whoever was registered was going to get the votes. And people didn't even want to win. They were afraid to win. They never thought that they would win. When they won, they were shocked. They were absolutely shocked. What are we going to do now, they thought. You know, this can't be serious because no serious candidates were really registered. Anybody who could really present a good opportunity
opposition were not registered. Only clowns were allowed to uh, run, and when clowns won, they were panicking. There is no Communist Party, there is no Liberal Democratic Party in Russia. Uh, Zhirinovsky has no power. And so there is no unified Russia party either. It was just a protest. Now about the first and the third question. What's going to happen after Putin? How is difficult is going to be our new path forward? Yes. We don't know. We can paint scenarios. Uh, that would depend on thousands of various aspects. But in the 90s, especially in the early 90s, we were moving towards a democratic system, I think. We built a lot of democratic institutes back then. The fact that they don't work now, at least they exist. At least they were built. Because, you know, as in the old Soviet joke, when um, people from a nut house were writing home that everything's so good, everybody's being fit so well, and there is a pool, and the doctor tells us to dive and to swim, and the doctor says that if you behave yourself, we'll even put some water in that pool for you. So the Russian, the Duma of the Russian Federation is the pool without water. We have committees, we have uh, various, uh, you know, uh, vote counting machines, we adopt and not adopt certain things, but there's no water in that pool. But we can't put water in there, and then it would work. So a pool without water is better than no pool at all, because a pool is a very difficult construction to build, and all we have to do is just put water in it for it to work. So I'm glad it's there. So I think we have a chance. What do I base this opinion on? Not just because of my desire for it to be so. Be not just because I want to live long enough to see Russia's return to democracy. No, I believe that uh, we have good youth, good young people who are well educated and um, oriented towards Europe. We have good European cities, Moscow, Ekaterinburg, Novosibirsk, European cities. Um, they could be richer, or poorer, more beautiful, less beautiful, but they're European cities. Catherine the Great once said that Russia is, um, by its nature, a European country, and I believe that is correct. And we mustn't repeat all of our past mistakes. History of the 20th century has um, been a very cruel experiment. It has demonstrated very clearly that there are necessary conditions for normal life, such as private ownership, market, free market, division of, of uh, government, and uh, freedom of the press. Of course, that's not enough. You can have all of that and still be a poor and chaotic country. But if you don't have that, then life is impossible. This is the prerequisites for normal life. I think it's been proven by now. And I think there are enough smart people who understand this. Also, we have enough people who want to have freedom. Every system is um, um, survives as long as people like it. And, uh, and totalitarian system has always had certain appeal. And Hitler, for example, used totalitarianism as the psychological basis for his regime. regime. And so, you know, it had all the various totalitarian um, tenets that um, he used to s support himself. And so, but we have a lot of people that like democracy. People like to do what they want. And, you know, why does a bird weave a nest? Because it likes to do that. It, it doesn't really plan ahead that it's going to, you know, lay an egg there and raise um, chicks in there. So there are many people like that that just like freedom for its own sake. And I believe that we have a chance, although it's all very complicated. As far as what should we do? Dear friends, I can't give you a direct answer to that question. Everybody has their own choice to make and do what is right for themselves. If you are not interested in Russia's destiny and fate, then maybe you should leave. Because, of course, life is better elsewhere. 
other than Russia. There are many wonderful countries. And as Brodsky said, you know, uh, Earth is round and firm everywhere. Uh, and I recommend um, the Earth of the United States. You know, why? Why not? If you are interested in Russia, if you want to contribute to its um, development, then make that contribution. Maybe it'll be interesting. And I think the next few years will be just as fascinating as the years at the end of the 80s and the early 90s. And um, you will receive, you have a lot of pleasure in participating. Thank you. Thank you to everybody who listened to us today. And good luck to Leonid, not just on TV, but in his main psychological profession as well. Thank you.